Last week, Psalms chapter 20, we're a little light on people here, so I, I won't take it too hard on you if we can't remember every point that we talked about. Does anybody remember, though, what we discussed from Psalms 20? Really? Uh, we need to always rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. Yep. <laughs> Sister Donna. Yep. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? <coughs> yes. Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord God. Verse 7 of that chapter. Now, Psalms 20 and 21 are kind of linked together. It's beneficial that they are back to back. Um, in the um, chronology that the King James has set up here. Um, t- uh, 21 is an answer and a praise of everything that was requested from Psalms chapter 20. So 21 uh, begins, The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and hast not withholden the request of his lips, Selah. Now, it opens up with a call, a, 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 well, not necessarily a call, but a, a proclamation that upon the granting of David's request, it says that the king shall joy. And then it says, basically, there would also be joy in the salvation. It says rejoice, but that's just, uh, the, the root there is joy. The When we have prayers answered, and I think we've had some prayers answered this very week, some, some visible and probably some invisible to us, uh, within our perception or out of our perception, um, there does not seem to be a lot of going around and praising God for granted prayers. Right. We, 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 I can even claim to be guilty of silently thanking Him myself, but to, to have joy, to rejoice, um, calls, at least into my mind, of the uh, the moment of your salvation, what is the what is the fruits of the spirit says that 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 a saved person will get will will gain the fruits of the spirit and the first two are love and joy and the joy the wellspring of joy felt upon salvation upon the upon your new birth um, is evident for everyone and you want to tell everyone you want to let others know uh, what the Lord has done for you. Uh, but it doesn't seem, that, and, and I don't think that necessarily, that the, and I'm not saying that it couldn't be interpreted this way in, in verse 1, but I don't necessarily think this salvation is necessarily the, the saving grace type of salvation, especially when you look at it in conjunction with chapter 20, where he's talking about being in battle, when he's talking about going up against foes, this salvation is probably just deliverance. And, and we don't see the same kind of joy, the same kind of truth-telling, the same type of proclamation and praise for the deliverance in our physical life the same way that we do for our spiritual life. We, uh, 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 we, we, we thank the Lord when, when we're saved. We thank the Lord when we, we have something revealed to us. We thank the Lord when we've had good services. But when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of uh, being thankful for what we, what we have, what we eat, the, the clothes that we put on, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the blessings of the day, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, healing for the sick and and, and all these things we, we don't we don't we don't see the uplift in joy and, and, and usually even if there is a mention of it you know it's it, it's it's a meager well thank the Lord and, and then we move on right. if and, I, and I've often done the analogy of us as children for the Lord and and, and compared them to two small children but if every time you did something for your children they never said thank you or it was just like thanks 
you'd very quickly get annoyed at the very least and or, or, or stop altogether. It, it is love that dry, that would probably drive the actions forward more to, to continue this. But one of the first things that we teach, especially one of the first things we taught our children, is to be respectful. And when someone does something for you, what do you say? Thank you. Please and thank you are some of the first things we teach children because people, separate and apart that type of teaching, are extremely selfish. It doesn't take very long for a child to believe that they deserve certain, certain things. And we're like children. We think that we deserve these blessings from God. And it's just like, thanks, big guy, and then we move on. And, 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 that, and that, that little lackadaisical, uh, semi-blasphemous attitude is how, is how we treat it most of the time. There is no joy. There is no praise. There is no uplifting. There is no raising of holy hands. There is no hallelujahs. Thanks. And we move on. David, the writer of this psalm, says that, and he kind of refers to himself in the third person, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation shall he greatly rejoice. So not only is he going to be, he, he is going to, what, two things that he's going to magnify there. Not, first of all, the actual deliverance. Which is that's easy to see when we when we see things change in our life because we've requested the Lord to do it. With that, those are things that are easy to see. But David is also saying he's, he talks about uh, shall joy in thy strength. It he is also wanting to make sure that we where's this power coming from? It it, it 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 everything should be pointing back to him. We can say thank you, Lord, for X. Thank you, Lord, for delivering Brother Junior from his uh, from his gallbladder issues, making that surgery go off flawlessly. But we also need to say, because you're the great physician, you are all-powerful. You created our bodies, and you guided the surgeon's hand. Amen. So it, it, go, it, goes, it goes one step beyond saying, thanks for this. It's thanks for this because you are powerful. Thou hast given him his heart's desire and hast not withholden the request of his lips. And I think last week we talked a lot about how do we get this, you know, how, how do we get to the place where we're able to say, Lord, I need this, and the Lord doesn't rehold, withhold the request of, of your lips. That requires a level of closeness and a level of, 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 um, of servitude that many of us will never reach because we don't have the wherewithal to find ourselves there. Can you? Yes, I believe you can. And, and you say, well, if I could just reach that place, then I could say, Lord, give me a million dollars, and I'll give a million dollars. But see, reaching that place, you will learn wisdom along the way that will keep you from doing foolish things like that. You'll be able to, like the model prayer in the New Testament, say, give us this day our daily bread, and move on from your personal desires and start talking about your spiritual needs. For, the ble for thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness and hast set us upon uh, and set us a crown of pure gold on his head. Now verse 3 kind of seems odd because it says, Thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness. Now it says that it almost sounds like that you're, you're, you're taking something away. And this is, this is where words in old 1611 English don't exactly mean, it's like awful. Awful in the Bible usually just means they're full of awe. You're, you're, they're, he's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, he, uh, full of awe, awful. But preventist actually can carry a meaning of uh, anticipation, of getting ahead of where you need to be. So it's not saying that he's going to prevent you. When we say prevent, he's like, we're going to stop. If I'm going to prevent one of my children from barreling off on the highway, what do I do? I grab them up and I hold them back. That's preventing them. But there is a, a in that, even in that action, a, um, a headspace, if you will, of I'm going to anticipate your move. And actually this can carry that term. So what he's saying is not that he's not going to stop you from getting blessings. In fact, later on in the verse he says, thou settest a crown of pure gold upon his head. So he's not stopping him from getting blessings. He is anticipating them ahead of David's request. How blessed it is to know that our Lord 
knows, and we've said this before, but knows what we need before we think to need it. He looks ahead and says, this is, this is, these are the things that they're going to need for this time, and I, and I know they're going to ask for them, and I'm going to take care of them. It's just like when, when, when my wife makes uh, lunch, I'm not usually there, so she makes lunch for, these, uh, for, for my two children. She anticipates that they're going to need to eat at around noon every day. And in so doing, uh, probably around along about, she's, I'll usually text her about 10 o'clock in the morning. Along about 10 o'clock, she'll say, I don't know what I'm going to make for lunch. And we'll discuss about what she's going to make for lunch. Now, have either one of the children requested lunch yet? No. They're still, they're still ruminating on breakfast. Uh, they're, 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 they're having a big time, or Gracie's fixing to start up school, or, or some, other things are on their mind. But the, their benefactor, the one that takes care of them, the one that care tends them, is anticipating those needs. And just in the same way, the Lord looks down from heaven and He sees fleshly and spiritually needs and He anticipates, He says, Jarrett's going to need this on this day. And you know what? And I, I said earlier, a minute ago, when we are talking about the blessings of the Lord and being thankful and joyful for the blessing of the Lord, that some things are invisible. They're outside of our periphery. And these are those type of things. Things that the Lord has anticipated ahead of time. And we think, well, th- that was a happy chance, wasn't it? And it wasn't a happy chance. This was the anticipation of the Lord. And He says, no, I'm going to, before you even have a chance to even think about acting, uh, act, asking for it, I'm going to be there. And a lot of time, these two youngins will go and they'll say, uh, Mom, I need food. And she says, oh, well, lunch is almost ready. And we turn to God and we say, Lord, I think we're going to need, and actually you just already sent us a paycheck in the mail. So what, what, we don't have to. But it is our duty to see those things for what they are. We are in a very blessed and privileged position to be able to look ahead, to, to look at things that are going on around us and, and see the strings, if you will, that the Lord is pulling. The, 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 the way that he is manipulating things to the good of his people and to the good of his work. Anticipated blessings are throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Elijah ran out of water at the brook Kedron during the drought. He didn't have anything else. The creek ran dry and the birds stopped coming eventually. And what was he going to do? Elijah didn't cry. Or Elijah didn't cry. Elijah didn't get bent out of shape. He said, "There is a widow woman, and I need you to go to her house, and I need you to stay with her, and you're going to go up to her house, and you're going to request a cake of the last food that she has. And if she is faithful enough to perform this, you're going to have everything you're going to need throughout this entire drought. See that in anticipation of God of what we need." When the children of Israel were hungry in the wilderness, God sent manna. When the rain started falling on Noah, an ark was already in place. When Abraham was fixing to sacrifice his only son in faithfulness to God, there was a ram in the thicket. Behold, it was just there. The anticipation of God for our needs. It's a glorious thing, and it's a thing that is easily, easily missed. Because why? Again, we're very, very self-centered creatures. Right. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said, the, the, the world doesn't, the, we like to think it is, but the world doesn't revolve around you. Separate and apart of us acting upon the environment around us, the world will spin right on past us. And it doesn't even care. We are not the center of the world. We are not even the cent- we are not even the, c- the center of our families. We're not even the center of our friend groups. And we're definitely. It, but but God takes out of His time, out of out of with, with you know He's not doesn't have a finite amount of of energy. But from His vast infinite amounts, He He still reaches down and says, "Larry's going to need this today." And whether he sees it or not, I'm going to provide this moment. Hypothetically, you know, Larry's going to have a flat today. And you know who's going to, you know who's going to be on duty and available for him upon the right time? Andrew Trescott. He's going to be on duty at work as an officer. And he's going to be there to help you because you don't have a spare. Because you're going to need help in that moment. 
and, and, and things are going to work out that way. And you can think, well, boy, Andrew is sure, sure, sure lucky that she was here. But, but no, these, these are blessings of God. He asked life of thee, and thou gavest it him, even length of days, forever and ever. His glory is great in thy salvation. Honor and majesty hast thou, hast thou, uh, hast thou laid upon him. For thou hast made him most blessed forever. Thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Now, he says that he, verses 4 and 5 basically reiterates that. Um, it says that he asked, he asked life of thee, and thou gavest it him. And it goes on, it says... He, even length of days forever and ever. And I don't think that this was length of this life. I think this was length of his, his, his soul, his spirit. Because make no, make no mistake, friend, the eternal resting place of the fallen, the eternal resting place of the damned, so to speak, is eternal death is hell, is eternal destruction. You're going to burn and burn and burn and burn and never be consumed, but always being destroyed. Hard to fathom, but that, that eternal death is the place. And in place of that, the Lord granted to David eternal life. You can live and live and live and stretch on for years and years and years. And he... Um, uh, and he goes on in verse 5, His glory is great in thy salvation, honor and majesty hast, hast thou laid upon him. Now what we talked about in verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, here he reiterates again, this is, we, we're supposed to, uh, when, whenever the Lord does something, it's all, it's all about pointing glory back to him. Everything that God does, and, and, and I, I guess if you, in the human mind, this may sound like the word selfish, but... Everything the Lord God does with all of His creation, both fallen and saved and, and, and carnal and spiritual alike, He does to bring glory to Himself, to make Himself happy, to make Himself glorified. For thou hast made him blessed forever, thou hast, uh, thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. Now verse 6 um, you, you, if you ever want to know who's a Baptist and who's some other religion, look upon their countenance. I think our, our countenance is one thing as Baptists that we could really improve. <laughs> we we look like we're miserable all the time. Yeah, we're, we're we're and even if that's not the case, even if saved and mad about it is not is is not the case. Well, even if we're glad about it, we seem to there 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 is no. Even if there's joy in our hearts, we don't express it. The Bible says here, For thou hast made him most blessed forever, and thou hast made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. The, 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 the Lord has, well, I mean, look at, look at Moses. When he looked upon, not even the countenance of God, when he looked on the hinder parts of God, he glowed. A powerful look, and, and just in the same way that, and, and you can read in the New Testament, Jesus's uh, face was one that demons feared to look upon. That those that were in need of forgiveness fell upon themselves to touch the hem of the garment of. And in the very same way, with, with with this bright countenance that the that the Lord God and Jesus exudes. It is in our best interest to also be, be the very same way, to be a light, to be a joyful, you know, to be a happy people, to, 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 to be a, a person that, you, in, 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 that, that does not look like you're just you're, you're mad at the world all the time, that, 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 that you're, you're, you're nearly inapproachable because you're, you look so angry all the time. Glad with thy countenance. For the king trusteth in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Lord, uh, the, uh, of the mercy of the Most High, he shall, he shall not be moved. Now why is all this come to pass? said, he trusteth in the Lord. Do you want blessings? You have to have faith. Faith, 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 faith. It, it, is the, it is one of the bedrock fundamental abilities that a saved person must master. 
And it is not easy. It is not an easy thing to have nothing and say the Lord will provide everything. Because we are geared as human beings that if I need something, I must go out and get it. Does that call upon us to be a lazy people? I don't think it necessarily calls upon us to be a lazy people. But when it comes right down to it, we look, we take, it's just like just like Joseph in Genesis. You know, Joseph worked real hard, but he trusted the Lord that even as a slave, as a prisoner, and as a, and as a second command in Egypt, that the Lord was going to provide all his needs in all those different places. And guess what? He did. As a slave, he rose to the highest position in Potiphar's house to the point that Potiphar didn't even know what he owned. He just trusted that Joseph had it. As a prisoner, he went as high up in the hierarchy that he could with a prisoner as, as a prisoner to the point where he was taking care of other prisoners and ultimately led him to translating dreams, which brought him before Pharaoh himself. And then as a vizier, he looked and he trusted the Lord when the Lord revealed truth to him about a drought that was coming, about a famine that was coming, that he did, he did everything in his power to trust the Lord and say, you know what, the Lord has given me this, the Lord's given me ahead information. He's anticipating the needs of a lot of people and I'm going to move upon that. I'm going to take it. And he provides every, every step of the way. But that trust is difficult to achieve. And because we never, you know, Brother Jarrett, he, he lifts. I don't know if he does it as much anymore. He hadn't talked about it in a while. Uh, but, uh, 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 but when he was, when, when, as he lifts, it is important to do multiple reps. Why? Because you're, 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 you, you start with you start with low, smaller weights and you rep up. Why? Because you're wanting to get your muscles used to carrying this weight. Because you're not going to be normally carrying this weight around all the time. That's how, not how muscles work. So you get, you get them all used to it, and it's like, oh, you know, after a week or so of doing this, it, I'm going to move up to a you know a couple pounds. And before long, you're doing that, and, and before long, you're you're benching 300. That's how weightlifting works, and that's how faith in God works. He will entrust you with something, and He will look to see how you do. And your faith will either grow or you'll collapse underneath the weight. And that's all dependent upon you. So many people want to have, a, have works in their religion. Well, this is where the rubber meets the world, where the works of the Christian, either you either succeed or fail. Thine enemies shall find out, uh, thine hand shall find out all the enemies. Thy right hand shall find those that hate thee. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Now, both hauntingly and, uh, and justly, the end of all that oppose us is written here says that he's going to seek out everybody that is against you, that is against him, and shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. Burning those that oppose. Lost person, that is your fate. No question. Don't have to wonder about it. There's only two destinations for the soul of man to arrive at. And separate and apart, a very close personal experience with the Lord God, that is where all of man is headed. And justly so. That seems sad. That seems cruel. But your very existence as a sinful creature and as someone who sins daily, is an affront to him. And separate and apart of the blood covering you, Brother Larry, or you, Brother Jared, or you, Sister Heather, or me, we're an affront to him too. It is only by the whitewashing of our sins with the blood of Christ that we are even remotely acceptable to God. Their fruit shalt thou destroy from the earth, and, and, their, uh, and their seed from among the children of men, for they, intend evil, uh, for they intended evil against thee. They imagine a mischievous device 
which they are not able to perform. Therefore shalt thou make them turn their back when thou shalt make them... Uh, 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 thou shalt make them make ready thine arrows upon the strings against the face of them. Be thou exalted, Lord, in thine own strength. So we will sing and praise thy power. Now, he talks about the turning of the tide. He says you're going to make them run, but then also while you're making them run, you're going to be you're going to have arrows ready. And then it ends says, "Be exalted, Lord, in thine own power." Nothing is more glorious to God than a ultimate display of His abilities before His own people. It's like Eli Elisha and his servant upon the hill, and he asked the Lord to, when a troop of naysayers came against them, soldiers, he said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see everything around him. And the full ability of God spread out in the hills in the form of angels and chariots. And he said, there's so much more here with us than it's with them. And that's, uh, that, those are God's angels. The, those are God's foot soldiers. Those are God's grunts. That's not even God's full power. It's a tenth of it. A minuscule hair sliver in compared to the massiveness of the universe of his power. If you want to see a display of his power, read Revelations where he comes back and steps upon the armies of the earth and squashes them out like grapes, a, mouth, a, a sword proceeding from his mouth. An entire battle against all the armies of the earth won by one individual on a white horse. And we are concerned somehow by little Sally Joe at the at the food market who makes fun of us for going to church. Right. Such small things we are. Mm -hmm. Lift him up in the things that you know and then in your prayer and to uh, to other saved lift him up in the things that you don't know about. His power is on display all around us. I think in Brother Ken's class on Tuesday night, he talked about the, uh, the world around us being a revelation of God. And even to the heathen, his power is on display each and every day. And you as a saved person, as someone who knows him personally, are given a very kind of back behind the curtain look at everything that he does to work all things accord, good according to himself, according to his own purpose, as the Bible says. And we should be thankful for those things. These, this oper, these operations are for you. They're for me. And, 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 and just as much as we are thankful for the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate work of Jesus on Calvary, that work is, or not necessarily that work, but, but, but the work of God for His people is ever continuing. He works, he's working in every situation from the lowliest to the, to the biggest in His way. Did everything work out in David's life? And, and this is a very lofty chapter. talks a lot about the things that were set around for David. Read the life of David. Did everything work out perfectly the day, way that David wanted it to? No, absolutely not. But that doesn't make this psalm any less true. Psalm, David lost friends. David lost family members. David, David was, because of his own... Um, warrior nature was unable to do a work for God that he so desperately wanted to perform. David got people killed with his sin with Bathsheba and then furthermore trying to transport the ark improperly. David did a lot of things that did not work out well for him and yet this psalm is still just as true because every situation worked out in David's life perfectly according to whose will? David's will? No. God's will. Things worked out for God to produce a lot of teaching for us. A lot of things we can learn from, a lot of things that we can look at, and a lot of things that point to him and say, you know what, David was a terrible person, but God worked through him to produce some great times for Israel. What more could he do for you? What work could he work? What could he use you like a funnel for his power and, and use you to help? and do something miraculous.
that kind of work and that kind of faith doesn't come easy, but it is possible. Any questions or comments on chapter 21 of Psalms? Brother Jerry. Yep. Out in front of you all the time. Anybody else? All right. Psalms 21's in the books. We press forward. We'll be out of the 20s someday. <laughs> Y'all have a great week. Thank you.